What's going on YouTube? It is time for another Peace Corps update. So, every time that I'm out and about and I'm doing all these things that I have to do, I'm getting stuff and I'm getting shots, people are like, why do you need this stuff? And I'm like, oh, well, I'm in the Peace Corps. And everybody's like, oh, wow, that's super cool, that's super amazing. Where are you going? And I'm like, I'm going to Rwanda. And then the reaction is usually like, ooh, ooh, ha, yeah. That's because whenever people hear Rwanda, they think of the movie Hotel Rwanda, which is a wonderful movie. If you have not seen it, invest in it. Hopefully, maybe it's on Netflix. Watch it. It's a great movie. But being that's the only reference that people have to Rwanda, they make so I'm um, really nervous. I think the fact that I'm leaving the country is what really makes me nervous. One thing that's really been helping me to try to get over the nervousness that I have is if I know the background to something, if I know how something's come about, it makes it a lot easier for me to be able to, to process it and deal with it better. And I understand why people get nervous when they hear Rwanda because they think about the genocide, but the U.S.'s history is paved on genocides and the removing of one culture and stealing it from another. So it's really doing the same thing and we live here. So, you know, it's just, I guess it's just the fact that that's so recent. Not that ours isn't recent, but you know. So here is a brief and fast overview of Rwandan history. Pre-colonial era, Rwandan broke themselves up into two into three groups, the Hutu, the Tutsi, and the Tiwa, which are indigenous people, so they don't really have um, a lot to do with what's going to be going on throughout the rest of history because it mostly um, revolves around the Hutu and the Tutsi. Now, typically Tutsi are cattle herders and Hutu are farmers. And being a cattle herder provides you with more money than being a farmer. So that's how they broke um, themselves up. It was a caste system. This system was based solely on how much money you had in your pocket. So it was perfectly possible to be born Hutu and die Tutsi. It was perfectly possible to be born Tutsi and die Hutu. Tutsi have more money, so they have more of a political power that's happening in Rwanda. So they start a monarchy, and it's run by Tutsi kings. So that pretty much excludes the Hutu from having any kind of upper level political power, but they begin to take over the middle and the lower levels. So it's like you have Tutsi kings, and then you have Hutu chiefs underneath those Tutsi kings. Now in 1894, the Germans decide to um, come on over to Rwanda and they look at the political system that they have and they say, okay, this is cool, and they begin to do administrative control indirectly through those Tutsi kings and they enter into a treaty with the Tutsi kings and they begin to protect Rwanda. Now, around this time, it's about the 1860s, a new theory comes out, um, the Hasmatic Theory. And it's a theory that states that Africans who have physical features that resemble Caucasians are therefore Hamites and a branch off of the Caucasian race. So um, typically Hamites are taller, they have thin uh, noses, more Caucasian-like features, and they're fair skin usually. So once the Germans get to Rwanda, they determine that the Tutsi are the Hamites and therefore they are more intelligent and more deserving to be in power. World War I comes along and Belgium knocks Germany up out of Rwanda. And the Belgians look around and see what the Germans have done and they say, cool, we're gonna stick with the Hamites that are happening here, we're gonna leave them in power. Now in the 1920s, the Belgians begin to systematically put Tutsis in power. So they give them preferential treatment for both education and political power. And in the 1930s, they begin this Tutsification, where they start taking all the Hutus that are in power and they replace them with Tutsis. About 1933, that's when they start giving the Rwandan people ID cards and classifying them officially as Hutu or Tutsi. Now, unlike the previous classification that was based solely on finances, now it's kind of based on how much money and how much cattle you have, but it's really based on how you look. So in the 1950s, the Hutus are like, well, you put all these Tutsis in power. We demand that we be represented as well. So we want a political party that is proportioned to the number of Hutus that there are in Rwanda. 
1959, Belgium decides that they're going to grant independence to Rwanda and they begin to kind of tear down this tutification political presence that they had uh, supported because they're going to give Rwanda its independence. At this time, that's when the first genocide happens. So about 600,000 um, Tutsi mostly, but Hutus are killed and a lot of them flee Rwanda. They become refugees and they take up in other countries. So in 1961, the monarchy is abolished, parliament elects a president, and the UN removes the power from Belgium and grants it to the Rwandan people. All these Tutsi who had fled Rwanda during the first genocide, now that there's a new president in place, that president happens to be Hutu, so a lot of these Tutsi refugees decide to attack this new Hutu government. The Hutus respond to this attack by um, basically executing all of the Tutsi leaders and removing the Tutsi political power. In 1973, there's a military coup that overthrows that Hutu president. And basically, there's just chaos for like the next five years. In 1978, a new president comes into power and he establishes one political party he says that's it, that's all the political parties that they're going to be. So all the chaos dies down, they enter into this time where it's nice and calm. So the Tutsis um, who had basically been refugees during the first genocide and during the chaos that broke out after the military coup try to come back and this president tells them that they can't come back into Rwanda because there's not enough room, there's not enough room. The, Tutsi refugees that aren't allowed back into their country decide to form their own political party known as the Rwandan Patriotic Front. And the Rwandan Patriotic Front has its own mil military known as the Rwandan Patriotic Army. So the RPA makes its very first attack on Rwanda in 1990 and the response is the genocide that takes place in the movie Hotel Rwanda. Officially, that genocide lasted about 100 days, but there's an entire time period where a lot more um, murders were happening throughout. So it really lasted maybe about two, two years. And over the course of that two years, 800,000, somewhere between 800,000 and 1 million Tutsi and Hutus are murdered during this time period. During this process, about 2 million Hutu flee Rwanda and a lot of them take up place in the Democratic Republic of Congo and they start causing trouble when they get over there. So Rwanda comes over to try to help the Democratic Republic of Congo starts fighting the Rwandans. They have a tiny little disagreement that happens there but eventually in about 2002 they come to a peace agreement and in 2003 Rwanda institutes a new constitution. So what's happening in Rwanda right now? Well, according to the Rwanda government website, Rwanda is in its time of peace right now. They've been in peace since 2003. They're straying away from the idea of being Hutu and being Tutsi, and they're taking on this idea of being Rwandan. So that is a brief overview and a brief history of what's taken place in Rwanda. In that background, having that backdrop story definitely makes me feel a little bit more comfortable since I know what's happened. Because as I said, the U.S. has some horrible things that have happened in our history too, but it's history. So it's really important to know where you've come from, to know where you're going, and that definitely gives me peace of mind. So I can go ahead and go over there and do my job and serve. And I post videos every Tuesday, so I will see you guys next Tuesday. Hit me down in the comments if you have any questions, tweet me. My Twitter is I'm underscore and underscore educator. So I'll check you guys next Tuesday. See ya.